months ago, and they still have a problem. And so I've seen both sides of the issue of being a practitioner as well as being a dentist anesthesiologist. And I see emergencies. I mean, I there isn't a day that I don't worry about having one. And even if it's just simply repositioning the head, it is an emergency. It means I have to jump in, I have to do something right now, I have to be aware. And so they're simple, they're easy. Most of the time you do them without ever even thinking about it. So let's go through this little presentation. It'll take us about an hour, and then what we'll do is you're assigned either group one or group two. And the way we're gonna work it is when I'm finished with this, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. Ladders don't work very well. <laughs> you're gonna to to go, take a 15 minute break, and then you're gonna to go to, if you're group one, you're gonna come in this room. If you're group two, you're gonna go in the other room with Ron Kaczynski, who's also a pediatric dentist and a dentist anesthesiologist. He trained at Long Island Jewish. Um, and we have three scenarios for you in each place. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna break off into, it depend, if the other people show up, great. If not, we won't be able to do this. But we have it planned so that we're gonna break you up into groups of three. If we have 12 people, that's six in a group, and two three-person teams, kind of like what you have in your office. And what we're gonna do is have the first group run through the scenario, which usually seems to be pretty simple. And then the second group that gets up gets a little bit of a twist to it, because you never really get one scenario happening at a time. It's usually two or three things thrown one on top of the other. And you have to think smoothly, clearly, and in a certain order to be able to treat these emergencies. And again, some of them are very easy. And remember, this is not the heavy duty cardiac patient with major problems where you're pulling out the different cardiac medic. We're kids, kids are good. Kids have good hearts and good lungs. So let's just get this going. And you'll see where this is coming from. So basically, medical and sedation emergencies in kids. Now, if you have any questions, this is my email. I think it's on one of the slides in the handout you already gotten. Um, but just, this is a scene you never want. This is Beth Israel Medical Center, which is in the middle of Manhattan. Do any of you notice anything strange about this picture? Is there anything looking weird? Are the lights too high? I can, I'm sure I could have them turned down. I was walking by one Saturday morning. All right, in quadrants, lower right quadrant. Anything strange in the lower right quadrant? Mm -hmm. What do you think? This, this black coffin right here in I front of the I, hospital? I, I thought it was a motorcycle, actually. <clears throat> you never want a coffin in front of your office. <laughs> you never want anyone to see anything happen. There is a, I review cases for the California State Board, and there's a famous case that we talk about all the time, and it's where there was a medical emergency on an adult, and the entire staff and the doctor went outside to greet the EMTs when they showed up. Mm. So we never want that situation. Some of you might also know about the case of a pediatric dentist in, in California who um, used chloral hydrate while taking out a third molar on an 18 year old. And the kid was sitting up the whole time. Um, kid stopped, the kid went through respiratory depression. The pediatric dentist got an oxygen mask and rather than laid the patient down, had the patient still sitting in the chair with their head like this and held the mask in front of their face like this. Not a good way to do it. So we're gonna to practice today and see what you need to do and not to make mistakes like that. I always show this bill because you talk about your anesthesia bills. This is what it cost to put my dog to sleep to clean his teeth. And one. It was between $690 and $1,325. So if you think you feel bad about charging what you do for dental anesthesia in your office, 
or for sedating patients in the pediatric office, think about this for my little dog getting his teeth cleaned. So what's an emergency? Simply, it's expected or unexpected. When I have those patients who obstruct slightly and I reposition the head, or I tell my staff to take their hand with the equipment off the kid's chest, that's an expected emergency. I expect things like that to happen, so I'm cognizant of them, I'm watching them, versus unexpected, but all of them are an immediate risk to health and demands immediate intervention. You need to do something. You need to reposition the head. Um, you need to treat quickly. How long does it take for you to have irreversible brain damage in a kid who's hypoxic? Three minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. In two minutes, you can have irreversible brain damage. Stabilization and definitive care. So we, though we go 10 minutes is the what you hear for adults, they have reserves. We have no reserves in kids. Kids have no oxygen reserves at all. And so you're looking at a two to three minute window to be involved, in place, and get the airway open. <clears throat> so you can have problems which are anesthesia related, usually airway problems, because kids again are healthy. They have healthy hearts, healthy lungs. You can have allergic reactions to drugs or procedures which are gonna close the airway down, drug dose related problems. The concept of overdosing, which I've never actually liked that term. You don't overdose kids, you just put them in a different level of anesthesia. And then you monitor and treat them at that lower level where you just placed them. So I don't like that term of overdosing. I believe that you, you violated what you were trying to do, which is you choose the drug, you, you choose the level of sedation, you choose the drugs that are appropriate and the doses that are appropriate to get to that level and you somehow either the kid's a hyper or a hypo responder. A hyper responder is someone who given the same amount of drug will go to a deeper level or you chose, you, you miscalculated. But again, you have to be able to rescue from a level, at least one level deeper than where your planned sedation is supposed to be. Local anesthesia overdose and laryngospasm. And then we have just the standard pediatric emergencies. Kids have emergencies. Airway obstruction with a foreign body, asthma, allergies, hypoglycemia. You have all those kids. How many of you have ever had a kid, a, a teenage kid, come in your office who's dehydrated and hypoglycemic because they're working out or they're trying to get a, a weight class down in wrestling or in some other sport which is weight related? I'm sure you've all had that. And you have that teenage girl who comes in, she's gray. She's sullen, she just really looks bad. What's the dose, by the way, for giving, what, how, many how many grams of sugar are you supposed to give a kid who's hypoglycemic in general? Does anyone know what's in? 10 grams. 10 grams is the starting dose. And we'll go into that in a minute. So what's the incidence of emergencies? I can't tell you, I have no clue. I have no clue what the incidence of emergencies is in pediatric dental practices or in practices treating children because there's no database for it. We have no way of knowing. Private practitioners never report what goes on in their office. We have no way of knowing. The only thing we know is morbidity and mortality. We know the mortality because those come up from insurance companies. At the end of every year, every insurance company releases what they call closed case analyses in which they've looked at deaths in offices. The other place you can find out deaths is by going to the state boards throughout the country. <clears throat> there are lots of numbers thrown out there. Um, in adults, it appears that the average death, the average number of deaths in dental offices is one per month in adults. In kids, there have been six incidences in the last probably 18, 20 months. So it's not unusual. The question is, could these lives have been saved had someone followed a procedure or been more prepared to identify the emergency and step in? So most of us recognize, but there are times we don't recognize emergencies. And if you don't recognize an emergency, it proceeds and then it throws another emergency on top of it, and you're treating two or three emergencies at the same time, which is what we're gonna see happen today in some of these. Um, 
The published numbers are unreliable. As you know, this was one of the, the life-changing articles back. Charlie Cote in 2000 talked about um, a couple of things. And one of them, he said, dentists are totally inadequate and unprepared to treat emergencies and possibly should not be doing sedations. He also, one of the other things that he found in this article, but he, of course he didn't, what he didn't do in his, his study was talk about those people in dentistry who are trained, as you are, to sedate and treat emergencies versus those who are just not doing it or didn't get the training and are giving drugs that they're not supposed to or weren't supposed to at this time to give. Since 2000, you know, every state has some sedation guidelines, some permitting. So um, the other thing he said, which was very interesting in this article, was that the farther away you are from a primary care center, the higher your risk of problems, which makes sense. Transport, how long someone gets to you. The average amount of time it takes for a paramedic or an EMT to come into your office, and we'll talk about the difference later, is supposed to be between four and seven minutes from when you make the call. Try that on rush hour on a Friday afternoon and see if it really works. So is that pretty much the same in Canada? The, the average time is they tell you four to seven minutes? Yeah, I mean, they, they, you always see the, the EMT trucks and the paramedic trucks parked all over the cities waiting for a call. But if two or three get called at the same time, they have to draw from another area. It can be 10, 15 minutes that you have to stabilize that patient. So most of them are set up in a four to seven minute range. So rescue is the key to what we're gonna to learn today. And it's the purpose of all emergencies to rescue or to bring the patient to a level where they're stable till you can get help coming in. You are not alone. And so 9-11 is not an adequate response. Picking up the phone, dialing 9-11, and then greeting the ambulance out in the waiting room is not appropriate. With an emergency, it must be hands-on, you must jump in, you must do, you must have the resources and training necessary, and it's not just you. It must be your staff, and we'll talk a little bit about the staff in a few minutes, and who's gonna help you. And neither PLS nor PALS guarantees success. And I'll show you a study in a few seconds about what you think you know when you walk out of PALS versus what you actually do know. And people who do it every day, what they retain, and then, by the time you get to rescue, is it too late? If you know that you can have irreversible brain damage by two to three minutes of hypoxia, by the time you've recognized the problem and started acting, is it too late? You know, we go by a rule of thumb that you should keep in the back of your head. Two thirds the resting, if, if your pulse rate drops to two thirds, you need to intervene. If your respiratory rate drops to two thirds, you need to intervene. It's just that simple. And if you're not starting when the number hits two thirds of what your measured resting value was, or your baseline value, then you've already bypassed the chance of getting something done quickly. So again, available emergency courses, there's PALS, which has been revised and revised again. Um, the problem with PALS is it's not specifically related to complications that we see. They do some airway, but you've got to remember when you treat PAL, you know, talk about airway management, venous access, treatment of shock, um, but the one thing it doesn't talk about is what we do. You know, when a PALS kid is brought in, in general, most of the PALS scenarios involve some kid who is normally ventilating, well hydrated, and then has an emergency. By the time we sedate our patients, they're dehydrated, we, they become hypoxic, they're acidotic, and they're on the way down, even just as we start our sedations. So our kids are at risk when we start. And so that's one of the reasons why PALS isn't great, why the best course you can take is an airway management course. Controlling the airway, getting airway, learning air, advanced airway skills. Pediatric emergency high frequency simulation courses like this are where you learn those skills, and that's why you're here. But our state boards may require us to have PALS. Um, the 
ADA, AAPD guide.